What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today I wanted to touch on a couple of pages from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that I think a lot of people either missed or didn't truly appreciate the value of, and that is specifically the parlaying with monsters spread. Now, in the original printing, it's on page 148 to 149, two pages, which I think is one of the reasons why this went so unnoticed. This book has a lot in it. This book has a lot going for it. And one of the things that just, you know, I didn't get talked about a lot that I think can be such a useful tool for dungeon masters and players out there are these two pages. So I'm going to get into specifically what is on these two pages and how I think that you can use them both as a DM and as a player. Obviously, if you're playing at a table and your DM doesn't want to use these rules, then that's the their prerogative at the table. But assuming that they are allowing whatever is in the source books, then you can really use these tables uh, and knowledge to really enrich your game and your character's uh, knowledge of the world around them. So let's get into it. So this can be really useful for players trying to investigate and figure out what a monster might want or need or just how they can most effectively talk to a monster or communicate with them in some way that is non-spoken language or if they just want to learn more about a creature's uh, environment or what they eat or what they're like. And so monster research is the first table. And what I love about this is it gives you the suggested skills for each monster type. So aberrations, if you want to learn more about them, roll arcana. Beasts, animal handling, nature, or survival, all the way down to uh, giants or humanoids is history, monstrosities, nature, or survival, um, elementals, arcana, or nature. So you get a lot of different options, and most of them have multiple skills that a player can use, kind of spreading around who can learn about them. The only ones that only have one skill are aberration, constructs, giants, and humanoids, being arcana and history, respectively, two and two. So what I really like about this is it eliminates a lot of the guesswork for a DM when a player says, okay, so we're going somewhere that we know there's going to be a lot of aberrations. What role do I need to make to know what my character knows about aberrations? Or what role do I need to make in order to learn more about aberrations to prepare for our adventure? You have this, you know, arcana, role, and then based on the DC, you can give them information. If they're researching a specific thing like mind flayers, then maybe you give them uh, what vulnerabilities or resistances mind flayers have. Or if they're just trying to learn about aberrations in that part of the world in general, then maybe if you're using a random table for encounters, maybe tell them that you have a 10% chance of running into a gibbering mouther in this part of the world, or a 25% chance of mind flayers wandering around, just looking and giving them that sense of the world if they succeed on a check. And if they fail, you can give them false information, which is one of my favorite ways to handle uh, particularly bad failures. So if they just miss the DC by one or two, then you know you can't find a whole lot of information, but you, you know that you were on the right path. You just couldn't get the right documentation to figure it out. But if they fail by like 10, you know, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, mind flayers, vulnerable to fire or uh, <laughs> vulnerable to psychic damage if you wanted to just really try to uh, um, I, I would I would just give them a false vulnerability, not tell them that something that a creature is actually resistant or immune to is a vulnerability. That's really just kicking them while they're down. But you get what I'm saying is you can provide them with false information. And, you know, most of the players that I play with would go on that journey with me. They would know I rolled a, a natural one on my Arcana check. So I know that this information isn't valid, but my character doesn't know that. So I'm going to go I'm going to go with it and have a good time. So that is the research table. It gives you different skills for every different type of creature in D&D 5th edition and how your players can effectively research those creatures and learn more about them. And one last thing is obviously cultures is also something that you can utilize this for. If you're dealing with creature types that have societies, like if they're rolling for celestials and they roll religion, 
and they roll really high because they're going to a plane that celestials live on, then obviously if they're trying to learn more about the celestial society there, then also that's totally applicable of learning about the, the hierarchy or the social mores and things like that that the players would benefit by knowing and then you can give out advantage and things like that if the players come prepared in that regard and before we continue if you are enjoying the video please be sure to give it a like subscribe to the channel it does help out a whole heck of lot and if you are enjoying the content here on the channel consider giving to the patreon patreon.com slash the geek pantheon is the place where you can financially support my endeavors here on the channel and it is uh, greatly appreciated for all of you who do choose to do that and then the rest of this two-page spread are random tables uh they're they're the desired offerings of various creature types so for dragons obviously golds or gems or uh, an antique passed down at least three generations for plants a pouch a pound of mulch uh, or undead uh completing a task the creature was in, unable to finish in life so you have all of these different uh desires and so what you can do in addition to providing them with information if they succeed on their research role is roll a d4 all of them are d4s and also tell them you know oozes in this part of the world uh really like cloth bearing a noxious odor just stinky clothes if you bring stinky clothes then the oozes might not fight you right away they might consume the noxious smelling clothes good thing laundry day is until tuesday so uh, yeah, you could do stuff like that and give them insight into what these uh, creatures or monsters or people are going to want. So how do we utilize this at the table? So I've kind of gone through some ideas as I've been talking about it, but obviously when you have players or if you are a player wanting to research a specific monster type, looking at the research table and getting a greater uh, codified understanding of what a player needs to roll for their character to learn more about those creatures. And then the desired offerings, you can either utilize those, you know, as uh, information found when researching based on that role. If they succeed, you know, you, you give them that information or if they fail horribly, you roll a D4 on another creature types table and say, yeah, plants really like gems <laughs> in these parts so you better load up on gems to throw at the plants while you're going through the forest um and yeah uh, you can get silly with it and it can be a lot of fun as long as you have players that are willing to go with you in that regard uh, i know some tables that that wouldn't work the player would know obviously they rolled poorly so they got false information and they wouldn't act on it which you know, sure. Yeah. Good job. You're, you're real smart. Uh, it would have been fun if you would have gone, gone with it, but cool <laughs> anyway. Um, but then from the inverse side, you can also use it as quests. If the players encounter an undead that they try to talk to, if, if your players throw you a curveball, and you know, they're like, I want to try to communicate with the ooze and it's like, okay so give me a check and you know based on the creature type obviously your mileage may vary but you can use those desired offerings to be like okay if you want to pass through our section of the woods then we're going to need this from you or if you just want to uh, placate the creatures then this is what you're going to need and that that can be the other interesting side of it is it becomes a quest giver as opposed to knowledge that you have going into a confrontation. So those are the two ways that you can approach utilizing these rules. Now, the additional question becomes when you're actually trying to parlay with monsters, uh, where do the social skills come in? Things like persuasion or deception or intimidate, because obviously you can roll an arcana check to have a level of insight about the mind flayer uh, colony that you are about to enter and know you know what they're resistant to what they're vulnerable to what their social expectations are like what their cultural hierarchy is what things do their culture value all that kind of stuff but once the players get in there what do you do and i think this is really where advantage and disadvantage come into play of if the players rolled exceptionally poorly and they got false information then you can throw disadvantage their way because even if they're not 
uh, wholly acting on the information, you can still say, you know, you're going in with the wrong expectations about how this conversation is going to go. Your character is. You as the player is not. But your character does not know what you rolled. Your character only knows what they found in the books that they were researching when you rolled a two. So uh, that's one way that you can approach it is throwing disadvantage for a really bad roll or giving advantage, obviously, for a successful check uh, if they especially if through role play they are utilizing the things that they learned and really trying to navigate the society in a meaningful way, then yes, absolutely. Throwing advantage on perception, intimidation, deception, all that kind of stuff. Even other skills. If if you have somebody that did uh, research for a, you know, humanoids cover basically all the player races. So let's say they're going into a dwarf city and they did a history check to learn more about the dwarves in this part of the world and they rolled really well. They they succeeded with flying colors. They learned lots of information about the dwarves. Then, you know, if they make a stealth check to sneak around the streets of the city, well, because of the research that one member of your party did, you know that uh, around one in the afternoon, typically there's no people on the street because lunch just wrapped up. Everybody's back at work working and, you know, people aren't moving around a lot in the streets. So that may be a good time to sneak around or, you know, noon is lunch break time. So the streets are going to be packed. So if you want to hide in plain sight, if you're a dwarf, if you're not, then you're going to probably stick out a little bit unless it's a diverse dwarf city but you get what i'm saying then they have that insight and that information to know when would be the best time to make a stealth check to try and sneak around the city and so they can have advantage on their stealth check or their sleight of hand check or you know even if even if it's you know a skill challenge like athletics or acrobatics they learned about the architecture that kind of stuff you can really through good research on the part of the players really give them a huge boon going into these situations if you want to uh it's it's like i said up to you so what do you think let me know down below comment let me know what do you think about these rules did they catch your eye the first time you read through tasha's or was it something that you kind of passed over in favor of all the other really cool stuff we got in tasha's uh, let me know down below be sure to like the video subscribe to the channel thank you all so much for watching i've been eric and i will see you next time